talks, not often I give a lecture to people with glasses of wine and thoroughly <laughs> enjoyment of the rest of it. And there are some folk here who I actually started work with in the early 70s. Anyway, just to uh, reinforce a couple of things and allow you to put some of the things I'm going to say in perspective. I'm a mining engineer. I started working underground for the National Coal Board in 1965. Yeah, I know that's scary, that's a long time ago. <laughs> Went through with the Coal Board, university, and then into a PhD at Nottingham on the stability of underground structures at great depth. And then I either graduated to metal mining or retired from coal mining, depending on where you sit in that perspective, to join Camborne School of Mines. And in the summer of 1973, I found myself underground in the deepest mine in the world, Western Deep was known as Western Deep Levels then, at 4,500 metres, rock temperature of 70 degrees C, 1,400 men working underground, and if the cooling systems failed, you had about two minutes to live. And there we were designing underground cooling towers to reject hundreds of megawatts of heat to keep the mine workings uh, safe. And interestingly, as a young engineer, when you're looking at the constraints on the depth of mining, it isn't the stresses and the uh, rock strengths and so on. You can cope with most of that. It's actually the cost of keeping the workings cool. So in, seven, in the, came back to Camborne, and Western Deep Levels is unusually cold at 70 centigrade at four and a half kilometers. South Crofty Mine, which was about a thousand meters then, was over 60 degrees C. So it was almost like a penny dropping moment. Hey, let's look at heat in its own right. And it started then, really, let's look at what the value of heat is and how it can be mined and extracted as a product. And you'll see the flavor of that as we go through. So Ian said, the audience is a complete mix. You've got experts and non-experts. So I'm hoping I've got something for everybody. There isn't any math in it. So if people are expecting solutions to the diffusion equation, we'll talk about it at the time, but they're not in the slides. I'm going to cover the geothermal industry and the geothermal business and what it's doing. And if you, don't, if you haven't been engaged, you'll be surprised how big it is and how active it is. I'm going to look at power production and I'm going to look at the direct use of heat plus heat pumps. There's three topics within, within the talk, all of which are applicable here in the southwest. Those technologies are more generally applicable, but they are applicable certainly here. Uh, and I'm going to look at power and heat. And you'll see the importance of heat. It gets underplayed. And then we'll talk about factors affecting development. I expect some interesting questions. Now, all geothermal talks start with the Earth's round and the middle's hot. OK, I'm starting with the Earth's round and the middle's hot. Key points to take away tonight is that you can use geothermal in ver its various forms anywhere. Here in Plymouth, uh, etc. There are heat pump systems running here in Plymouth already. And it's sustainable. It isn't dependent on the weather, etc., etc. So it's a 24-7 base load uh, energy provision. And that's one of its great advantages. It's completely flexible from shallow to deep. The resource is an immense stored base of energy. Now, you quite often get a question that says, well, it's not renewable because it depletes. Well, if you design them properly, it depletes very slowly and you've got an immense resource. So we treat it as renewable, but strictly, in absolute academic sense, it's the stored energy we're going after. It has the technologies that are there to provide heat, cooling via absorption chilling, and electricity. If you're using electricity in terms of the pump or displacing electricity, it's a step transform technology. It's either getting rid of all the fossil fuel or it's getting rid of 70, 80% of the fossil fuel if you're running a heat pump or heat electric pump circulation. So it is not just a few percent, it's an enormous percentage. 
In terms of heat pump applications, you can use non-fossil fuel as your supply, so solar, wind, nuclear, alongside heat pumps for heating and giving you three or four times the energy, decarbonising the, the, the heat, one of the holy grails of energy provision. And it's economically competitive now, but for the fact the government have got its fingers in the works with these funny incentives called FITs and RHIs and so on. Get rid of all of that, geothermal wins hands down. And it's accepted in the marketplace. We can get projects financed, we can get them done, and people will buy the process. So what is it? It's our enormous fission reactor. We're going to be talking about heat that's generated primarily from the radioactive decay in the crust. There is some coming through from the centre of the Earth, but most of the heat we're using is, from any depth is uh, radioactive decay, from radioactive decay. Certainly all over the southwest and over much of Europe, we can get to 200 C within 7 kilometres. Here in the southwest, we can get to 200 C within 5 kilometres. Um, now, that has to be an attractive holy grail to be able to use temperatures of that type. Uh, and you're going to see how we uh, look at it. Now, don't be shy. Who are these gentlemen? Who's the one on the left? Shout out. Come on. It's Trevithick. So, we look at his role. Now, if you didn't get Trevithy, you're not going to get the one in the middle either, but every one of you, I suspect, knows his name. It's Lord Kelvin, William Thompson. You all know his name, but you don't see his picture very often. We'll leave the one on the right. You don't stand a hope of getting that one. <laughs> so, UK has had a geothermal interest for a long time. Obviously, people know about the Bath Springs, prehistory. Trevithick was really concerned about how to cool mines and he developed what is effectively a heat pump process. He didn't call it that and actually its successor is the cooling system on Tornado aircraft today and it traces the technology right back to Trevithick and that it was specifically done for cooling mines. William Thompson, Lord Kelvin, developer of the compressor heat pump, chaired a whole series of Royal Society meetings on the nature of underground heat. Now remember, this is before radioactivity is being discovered. And you should, when you read those transactions, the contortions they got in to try and explain why the underground environment was hot. And they made the most amazingly accurate measurements. Here they are uh, over the Dolcoth mine, which is just outside Camborne. It was already a thousand metres deep in 1860 deepest hole in the world of any type and they were making temperature measurements and made, used mercury in glass thermometers and uh, the expenses on the various committees are a large number of broken thermometers. <laughs> but in this picture they had all, oh sorry, in this picture they had already worked out they had to have a very accurate depth measuring system. And that goes today. People who are involved in geophysics and wireline logging, it isn't just the measurement, you've got to have the depth measuring system right. Um, and they put a lot of effort into getting their depth right. You'll see why that becomes relevant in a minute. Now, there was then, and I haven't got a picture of him unfortunately, a most amazing character called Starkey Gardner, who was an iron founder in Wandsworth. And he got really passionate about the smoke and pollution in London from open coal grates and he had worked out how it was uh, building up really difficult conditions in the air and he put together a proposal to drill holes 10,000 feet deep under London and replace all the coal heating systems by a geothermal system. Put a lot of effort into it and it would have worked. When you look at his numbers he had them right and correct. And his mission was to get rid of the pollution from the coal burning and to save coal as a precious carbon resource that could be more useful than just being burnt in open grates in houses. It sank without trace. 
It was presented at one meeting, a bit of discussion, it never crops up again. And then the guy, you, the guy I said you would never get, and you might have done in Plymouth actually, is Charles Parsons, the inventor of the turbine. He got very seriously involved with geothermal in Cornwall from 1904, and he came up with a design for a thousand megawatt station. And it was going to be on shafts 12 miles deep with heat exchange galleries. Now actually, knowing what we know now, that would be at about 450 centigrade. So it's not really understand how, how you would do that. There is an enormous correspondence. It, 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 oh, what have I done? Help. Do I just go back to it? Yeah, <laughs> but you get the instant talk at that point. Uh, I must have caught something, yeah, mustn't I? Yeah, I think it's there, isn't it? Let's go back to that. Yeah. Is that okay. it? Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, Charles Pars. Sorry about that. Um, enormous correspondence with the Boscown family, Lord Falmouth, uh, at Tregothnan. And they even had a site, a little busy site, which is near where I'm going to be showing you. Um, and apart from getting the depths wrong and so on, he, he, he had the basic physics right. Um, and that then languished after that. But there's a letter to Lord Falmouth that says, this will be taken up in 85 years' time, and it's 1922. So he wasn't far out, was he? <laughs> so, let's look at a couple of applications. What do we want this geothermal heat for? It's, we've got this big heat source underground. Well, if we look at the way energy is used, and this is attempting to work out the fraction of energy, or percentage of energy, that's used for specific applications across a whole range of issues. This was put together by Jeff Tester, who's now the head of the equivalent institution to this at Cornell, but a long time back. And you can see that 50% of the energy is actually used for space heating at around 50, 60 degrees. Now, when that work was done, uh, people thought it was going to change. It hasn't changed that much. It has, but there are attempts to update this. It's a very tricky graph to... I'm sorry, I've got to be a bit more careful. It's a very tricky graph to um, produce. So, if we look here, space heating, and then we look at the average well temperature and spring temperature of all the European wells, sorry, I've got there. Yeah. I'll get better at this. Um, you'll notice how well they match. So 50% of the European wellhead temperatures are just under 50 degrees. So actually, one of the big applications for geothermal energy is indeed exactly what Starkey Gardner wanted to do in 1885. It's heating and cooling. And you'll see... I, I, I've put some examples in about how that's been done. And in fact, that will be one of the more successful areas because you don't have to get particularly high temperatures to do that. So, let's look at geothermal uh, as it is today. And I'm going to split it very crudely into greater than 150, less than 150 C. So... Temperatures greater than 150 are generally used for power generation. There are some process heat pro, uh, being done there. The really profitable, really successful geothermal systems are at about 1,500, 2,500 metres deep, and they're at 200 to 280. There are systems much hotter than that. We were involved in several that are up in the 300, 400, just getting into supercritical. The problem is they come with some very nasty chemistry. 
in that one I've just mentioned, we had dry hydrochloric gas in the steam. So when the steam condensed, we had high temperature hydrochloric acid, really tough to deal with. So the very high temperature stuff you need to be very careful about. Some of you might have been following the Icelandic supercritical well that's been drilled. Um, and they will have the same sort of issues uh, when they, when, when they, if they start to produce any liquids from it. Some of the systems are very shallow. There's a system in Indonesia which is 200 metres deep at 130 degrees C. I mentioned some of the hot ones. They are virtually all associated with volcanoes or uh, plate boundaries. Less than 150, mostly direct use. There is some power generation and people are getting better at low temperature power generation. Highly diversified, used for all sorts of things. Um, predominantly space heating and thermal baths and food processing. One of the bigger growth areas, Russia and the northern parts of Europe, is in intense highway de-icing, storing the heat from the summer and pulling it back in, in, in the winter to avoid icing on uh, bridges and overpasses. So, what do we look for? And I need you to remember this slide because it crops up, the, the implications crop up in several places. We need a heat source in the ground. And obviously, in, you can see in these pictures here, um, one on the left is the area near Kakonda in Japan, where they have a hole at 500 degrees C that was drilled in the late 80s. You might have been, has anyone been to St Lucia? This is the, this is the waterfall on the outlet from the uh, uh, Soufriere volcano and that's in Yellowstone. So evidence of heat source in the ground, it's got to be appropriate. If I'm looking to do power generation I'm looking for 150 C plus, is it there? And we'll look at some of those conditions for Cornwall shortly. If I'm doing heating, it only needs to be a lower temperature. There's got to be a heat source there. We've then got to be able to circulate water through the rock or take water out of the rock through the pores, the fissures, might be flooded mines, might be pipe work that you've installed, could be Parsons galleries. But there's got to be the ability to pass water through. You will see articles by people like LBL talking about using supercritical carbon dioxide as a circulating fluid. Well, that's fine, but right now it's water. And there's got to be a sustainable source of water. Is it coming out of the ground as a sustainable source or are you having to re-inject and circulate it? And then you've got to have some gadgetry and some engineering to convert the heated water into something useful. So turbines, heat pumps, heat exchangers, however you're, you're doing that. And they are the four technical requirements. So every time we look at a geothermal project in a minute, you'll, I'll be highlighting the four requirements that are in there, particularly for, related to Cornwall. And finally, not really technical, you've got to have somebody who wants to buy it. It's no good having this wonderful geothermal system high up in the Andes that's beautifully characterised, lots of water, lots of high temperature, and nobody there, or 800 miles away or something. So there's got to be somebody for it. So um, there's an awful lot of characterisation of geothermal systems, but they do tend to be too remote from the users. So part of that is the, someone to sell it to or use it. So where's stuff going on? Every five years, International Geothermal Association, and in particular this guy, Ruggiero Batani does a survey to collate everything that's happening. This is a couple of years out of date now. Um, and you can see there's quite you know, 3,000 megawatts in the USA, 3.4 gigawatts. Mexico up at 1,000. Uh, Philippines at 1,000. Indonesia at 1,000. Now, since then, there's been a big surge. So we've got 12.6 gigawatts, 12.6 thousand megawatts. Uh, but Turkey, for example, has gone up to 800. 
Uh, Kenya's up near 800. Uh, Indonesia's up to 1900 with very aggressive plans to go forward. So the installed capacity is increasing uh, fairly rapidly. It's likely to be, by 2020, it's likely to be pushing on towards 20 gigawatts. So quite active, uh, not here of course. Um, the nearest equivalent to here in the uh, or places like Germany, some activity in Australia, although that's pretty much come to a dead stop for reasons we might talk about later. Now, key point on this slide is this figure here. 73.55 terawatt hours. That's what you get paid for. You don't get paid for installed capacity. You get paid for what you sell and generate. And worldwide, the average availability of all of those plants, so all of that 12.6 gigawatt plants, is 75%. You know, put that against solar at 11% or wind at 25 30%. That's really good. More modern plants are in the 95, 98% availability. They are there 24 seven. They are ultra reliable. And that's one of the attractions. Now, what's the common factor in the locations of all of those? Gosh, you are quiet. It's the plate boundaries. <laughs> they are virtually all on plate boundaries. Uh, or spreading centre here for Iceland, for example. The, uh, and you can see, as you look, we're coming down, when we look at some of the American projects in a moment, coming down through in the geysers, coming down uh, along the San Andreas, across here into Turkey, around the Ring of Fire, into Indonesia and so on. Now, while that slide's on there, there's one area which is underdeveloped completely. There is effort, there is con people looking at it, but Chile and so on, down, down, down the Andes mountain chains and so on, there's obviously potential that can be developed. Um, an area of great excitement in the geothermal business is the African Rift. You've got Kenya, you've got Uganda now, you've got Ethiopia. They all have got fairly <coughs> major development programs. Um, and one of the other things you find when you're in the geothermal business is they're in pretty nice places. Uh, quite often, especially volcanic areas, they're near vineyards. <laughs> well, when you go up into the geysers, you have to go through Napa Valley. Oh, what a shock! <laughs> so they're really good. So. But power production, commercial power production, means volcanoes and plate boundaries. Now, in 1990, Iceland came to the UK and said, we'll build uh, power plants for hydro and geothermal and we'll bring it ashore as a cable. We'll bring you up to four gigawatts of geothermal power. And we told them to go away. And they came again in the mid-90s and we told them to go away again. They've come again recently and they've been welcomed <laughs> with open arms. <laughs> so that would be geothermal and hydropower, about up to four gigawatts coming ashore directly into the UK via an interconnector. And they would fund it themselves. Well, it'd be a joint venture with uh, Pirelli, the cable company. But there's then going to be opportunity for UK companies to be developing geothermal, plant and geothermal processes within Iceland. Now, there's pushback within Iceland from the Icelanders. Why are we giving our indigenous energy away? Which is uh, a bit of a challenge. Um, but actually, you think that would really be quite useful to us at the minute. So, what does a power plant look like? What are we going to actually do? This is in the Mayakamas Mountains. This is uh, the geysers. This is a 55 megawatt plant of the sort that would be developed in Cornwall really quite small, turbine house in here, um, 
cooling towers at the back, and you wouldn't necessarily need cooling towers in Cornwall, you could use water. And, and, and in this case, uh, we get from in the geysers, you've got open steam systems, so we have some gas extraction and gas handling. Uh, you, again, probably not needed in Cornwall. And clusters of wells. Uh, in this case, the geysers typically about two and a half thousand metres at about 250, 270 centigrade. By the time it gets to the surface, it's pretty much dry steam, some steam separators, so there's a bit of underflow of water from the separators. The steam goes to the turbine, through the coolers, condenses, comes back, completely closed loop, goes back down the injection well. So there's no gas discharge other than if you need to take some gases out of the turbine. Now, in addition to that, they have started augmenting the injection water with wastewater from uh, the local towns and so on, and that's increased the production by about 50%. So they're putting water into the hot rocks, in the naturally hot rocks, and increasing their production. Cloverdale town. So, where's this going on? You've seen it on the maps, but look at the countries that dominate. USA, Philippines, Indonesia, Mexico, New Zealand. And there's been folk I know from Camborne who've actually gone and joined US companies uh, doing geothermal. There's Camborne folk in Indonesia. So we are exporting people to, to there. Oops, don't again, need to stay away from the keyboard. And you can see that it's a handful of countries that actually dominate the business. So there's 24 or so altogether. But that rather underplays the importance of geothermal to some of these countries uh, in a percentage term. You know, somewhere like the, the Tibet area of China, more than 30% of its power comes from geothermal. When I did this graph originally, New Zealand wasn't on the list. New Zealand's up to 16%. And th the importance of having an indigenous power source for places like Costa Rica and El Salvador, not necessarily the Philippines, because they're pretty wealthy anyway. Costa Rica's another one. Nicaragua has crept up to about 20%. You can't underplay how important it is uh, that they don't have to pay hard dollars for oil-fired power, or which will be their other, other equivalent. So this is, this is really vital for some of these countries. So what are the costs look like? This is uh, the Wairaki station just north of Taupo on the North Island uh, in uh, New Zealand. I did say there were nice places to go. Um, and you can see a relatively clean environment, hot water discharge coming from the side of the plant. Um, if we look at the costs, what's the generation cost? Well, it's somewhere between 4 and 9p a kilowatt hour, which includes the, uh, the financing. So it's quite reasonable in that sense. In New Zealand, it's down to 1.5 to 3 pence a kilowatt hour. Um, because their, their systems are shallower and cleaner and uh, less environmentally difficult. The capital cost, $2,000, $6,000 a kilowatt, might sound high if you've been comparing it, on, if you know about the costs of gas-fired plant and so on, which are in five to $600 a kilowatt. Typically then, you've got to buy your gas and it's a bell, whatever your fuel source is, is a variable cost. The problem is, with geothermal, you buy all your power, all your fuel on day one when you build the system. Um, so th there is a high capex. And the way our systems operate for power sales, you'll see later, uh, are preclude at the moment high capex systems. And look at the difficulties trying to finance nuclear. Same thing, high capex, low running cost. On the heat side, we can be delivering heat from a geothermal system down at 0.7 pence a kilowatt hour. Typically, the best gas systems are down near three, and we can certainly get down well below three 
uh, on good geothermal systems. If we look at emissions, if we vent off some of the carbon dioxide that's coming in the steam, we're down at uh, 60 to 100 grams carbon dioxide. Typically, the UK grid at the moment is 350 grams per kilowatt hour, and that's with uh, the gas fire and the wind component. With reinjection, that's zero. So you have your electricity potentially with zero emissions. But of course, there's no real value at the minute. There's no social cost of CO2 yet. Um, it, it's just a nice warm badge, but clearly it's a zero emissions technology. And it saves, a, well, it'll be over 100 million tonnes of carbon dioxide a year. Um, it's only around 1% of the world's power production, but it's got revenues of 7 billion a year. But put that in perspective, that's two days from the oil patch. Um, it employs about five to 7,000 people. So where's it going, this existing technology? Well, the USDOE, Geothermal Energy Association, did a review and they said, and their conclusions were, that there were proven reserves. And again, for geologists and folk, you'll know what I mean. Proven reserves is something that's economic to mine today, economic to do today. You've got a market, you know where it is, it's all proven, you're just going to do it. Well, there's 55,000 megawatts there as the low hanging fruit. The probable resource, so looking for equivalent areas that aren't quite. Uh, fully explored and fully tested, they're saying it's double that. And remember, we're at about 20. So there's a good <coughs> amount of energy still to go for. Second, and then this is an Iceland and I'm talking in Geysers, the did a re worldwide review and reckoned that only 0.2% of the resources are, are actually being utilised. Now, he hasn't then gone on and filtered it and said, and some of it isn't where it can be used. Um, but he was arguing that total resource was the same sort of size as hydropower. In the UN, it took those numbers, it's a UN number, the increase of geothermal activity by a factor of 100, which is huge. If they are rockets, that means the geothermal industry would become one third the size of the oil factory. That takes a bit of thinking. The oil patch went from nothing to its size over the last hundred years, so maybe that's all that. But let's add some new technology. It's not that new. Here's us in 1985 in the quarry of the Estidian, which is quarry. And this is during one of the experiments. We've got big pumps here, we're pumping water underground. There are three wells. One in the middle, another one here, and we're circulating um, fluids at up to 264 kilos a second. Remember that number when we come to look at some of the detailed things. And this is really the system that was described by Parsons, except we're using well boards and connections through fractures. He had mentioned in his introduction, it's known as hot dry rock enhanced geothermal systems, engineered geothermal systems in GS, and typically for a commercial system here in the UK, we be dreams of four and a half to five and a half kilometers here in the southwest um, 45 years of work, about 500, 600 million worldwide uh, spent on the R&D programs. There are three or four projects actually working now, one in France, uh, one in Germany, sort of one in Japan, a bit prototyping, and two in the USA. So these systems are beginning to work. The ones that are being more successful are the ones that have gone for natural fault structures and so on that we're going to see in a minute. The EC 15% of Europe's electricity by 2100. Now, what they're saying is, your age group is going to do this, it's not my age group. This is down to you guys and your contemporaries to 
in Germany. There was a very detailed study in 2006 which looked at the future of geothermal energy in Japan, just from being run, like of Tesla, to look behind it at the northern United States or what the barriers were. It worked. Here we are, this is the summer of 1985 in Rosenhaus. We are producing water at 70 cents per acre uh, at 50 litres a second. Uh, so in terms of proof of concept, we actually flow water through those interconnections between the worlds in 1980. <coughs> so what does a commercial system actually look like? What are we heading towards eventually? Here. We're going to inject water down an injection well. And in this case, we've got one injection well of 300 kilos a second. I mentioned 264 in those original experiments. And this is a system which is going to have modules of an injection well and producer wells. In this case, we can use three modules. And we're going to be producing about <coughs> 63 megawatts net. About 82. And then we have some other bits and pieces to do. Oops. Yeah, I'm not doing very well with my aids, am I? Mm -hmm. So, inject the water down, 300 kilos a second, come down through the fracture system, comes up 100 litres a second up each one of these wells and we have mixed water and steam 900 kilos from them much so 300 from this one 300 from each of the other two 900 altogether into a separator which is just a flash vessel we're just letting the steam flash so that will come down from about 200 to about 150 and about 130 odd kilos a second comes off the top, the so-called high pressure steam, but it's only 4.5 bar. And it comes into the centre of these turbines. Now this is off the shelf technology, you can buy this from several manufacturers. And there's an underflow here, about 770 kilos a second at 150, comes into a second separator where it's flashed for a second time, so we get lots more mass of steam, another 70 kilos of steam comes off and we get 700 kilos of underflow. So that steam goes into the low pressure end of the turbines and it's just a conventional turbine system then. And it's likely to be four modules actually, four times 22 or something like that, simply to get the right size of the blades. Now we've got 700 kilos at 100 C underflow. What on earth do you do with that? doing that in the middle of Cornwall, what can you do with 153 megawatts thermal? Answers on a postcard at the end of the talk, please. I have no idea what you do with that much, that much heat in the middle of Cornwall, but there's a lot of it. So we need some innovative thoughts. And then it's injected and goes round again. In this case, I've got a surface condenser, so I'm using seawater condenser, the steam condenses there, and I get 200 kilos coming back from the condensation. So you could imagine, any of you know Cornwall, something like where the hail power station was on the estuary, any one of the um, est estuaries you could, could be using that. So you'd have 10 of these, that, that you get your 1,000 megawatts, 10 of these somewhere between Dartmoor and Land's End. Now, you've all spotted, all of this is conventional technology up here. There ought to be a blob on the bottom saying, and a miracle occurs because it's the interconnection and the flow through the fracture system that really matters. And that's where all the research work's going on. So, let's look in Cornwall at a bit more detail. It's known to be hot underground. I can take you underground to places where 60 centigrade is there from the rising hot water. It's been known for years. I can't do the accent, but some of the old miners would say, hot enough to shave my anthem. So, it's hot. 
these are much higher temperatures than you find elsewhere. The highest temperature measured in Cornwall to date is 99.8. What a curse, we didn't drill deep enough to get over 100. But we didn't. Why is it hot? These are heat producing granites. And if we look at a map of the UK over the heat producing granites, three areas really, East Highlands, Weirdale and Cornwall. Now, the units sound ridiculously small per square metre. This is heat flow from the ground, 70, 80 milliwatts a square metre. Lake District's a little bit warmer, Lake District, Weirdale. And we get down to Cornwall, plus 120. The area we're going to be looking at was over 140. It's over 140. So it's the heat producing granites that are driving the heat. Geology map of Cornwall. Bob Minmore, St Austell, Carmen Ellis. This is the Campbell and Redruth mining district in here, Land's End. There are three projects on the stocks for Cornwall. There's the one I'm going to be talking to you about tonight, which is our one at United Downs. There's another one at Jubilee Pool, which is supposed to be drilled next uh, winter to heat part of the seawater. The, the sea, it's a seawater pool, and part of it they want to be heated, much to the objections of some of the locals, actually, who like their freezing cold seawater pool. But, but anyway, there's a plan to warm a bit of it. And as, as uh, Ian mentioned, we've got Tim Smith up at Eden. There is, a, there is a, a project at Eden which may get funded uh, to put some deep holes uh, at Eden and then use the heat uh, with the biomes. But I'm going to be talking to you primarily about United Downs. Now, the Rosemanau site where you saw those pumps is just a few kilometres due south of United Downs. So one of the reasons we're as confident about what we say about the uh, temperatures at least at nearly three kilometres uh, is because Roseman House is on its doorstep. For those structural geologists, the principal horizontal stress direction is essentially northwest southeast. So it's, it's cutting diagonally across here. I haven't got the detailed um, rock mechanic stuff in, in the talk tonight, but Ian said there was structural geology in, so folks, so principal stress directions here. It's a transpressional strike slip regime from about a kilometer or so. Now, the heat is coming from the granite. And the best data we've got about where, how, what the volume of the granite looks like comes from some gravity data. Uh, and this is an inversion of the gravity data from, from the early 90s by BGS. Um, there's Dartmoor. I've put the map back over the top. We're interested in the volume of the granite. There it is without the map on it. And these volumes have been taken into a 3D kind of element code that's got the heat generation and the heat flows and so on. So there is a three-dimensional version, although the stuff you're going to be seeing tonight is all one-dimensional. And that was done by somebody called Jonathan Willis Richards. So we've got the three-dimensional heat and it, the, the volume of heat that comes from these granites. So remember my questions, will it be hot enough? Let's look at our temperature prediction. Well, here's the heat flow in and around our United Downs site. For those of you, that's the Wheel Jane Tailings Dam, just there, if you, if, if you know the area. And this happens to be one of the hottest spots in Cornwall. And the granite goes off as a lip to the north here. And you can also see as a fault trace we've got mapped on. We'll talk about that a bit more in, in, in a minute. These are temperature gradient numbers. Um, obviously, when they're in the granite, they can be a bit lower than the temperature gradient numbers that are out with, uh, under the slate because of the difference in the conductivity. So 
Uh, the conductivity variation is important, but we've chosen this area because it had high heat flow and it had this fracture system involved. So how did we extrapolate the temperatures? We got good temperature measurements, existing mine, lots of temperature gradient holes. Somebody mentioned outside in earlier on Jim Wielden's name. Jim Wielden and his team measured temperature gradient holes throughout Devon and Cornwall. Um, thermal conductivity and Pacific heat was done from various core measurements. And the near surface heat flow uh, corrected for a paleoclimate if they were very shallow is just simply the conductivity times the local temperature gradient. So that's how the heat flow was mapped. And it was then used to produce temperature with depth. And the heat production numbers, conductivity, and you'll see why the conductivity is important in a sec. And all that brings uncertainty. So we then had to do some statistical work to, to get a good view about what was happening. One of the key data sets was from a well called RH12 in Rosemanau, which wasn't the deepest well, but it was the one with the most accurate temperature measurements. I'll come, come round again. There's the temperature profile down this panel of the log. This is the real log, right? So this is the original data. And it was take, the, the three lines are taken at different times after drilling. And the one that Jim Wilden measured is this last one, 29th of April. And there's the temperature coming down. You can't really see anything variable on that. 77C at 2,000 metres in this well. But look at the gradient. The gradient at 1,000 metres is 33C per kilometre. The gradient at 2,000 is 38C per kilometre. That's a wiggle around the casing and that's a wiggle around the end of the well when it stopped drilling. So the gradient is increasing. Why should that be? Well, we'll look at that in a sec. Where we are at United Downs, we've got about 1,250 metres of Killis, the local name for the, for the slates. And the conductivity of that is pretty well constant, 2.53. The thermal conductivity of the granite varies with temperature, and that's why you start to see these gradient changes, and it changes, it varies quite a lot. The Killis represents a slightly insulating layer. Just to the north of us, there's a gradient at 39C per kilometre because of a thickness of, of Killis overlying the, the granite. The conductivity varies. These are, these are measurements that have been made on Rosemanau's core. And it depends whether it's fine grain or coarse grain. We've typically used the fine grain numbers for the models you're about to see. The heat production, this is an interesting number, small discussion before the meeting, four microwatts per cubic metre, very small, can't be measured by calorimetric methods, has to be estimated from the uranium, thorium and potassium. These themselves are estimated from spectral gamma logs and they assume that the decay chains are in equilibrium. And I'm not sure that's valid. I think you might have missing daughter products. I think you might be underestimating the heat production, some of the heat flows from, from here. However, this is best we can do at the minute. Research projects, folks. Equilibrium decay chains with the uranium, with your nice microprobes and all that good stuff, looking at the minerals. Are you smiling, John? <laughs> it's not a new problem, you understand. So, the way we do it, we start with the surface heat flow, in this case 120. As you go deeper, we subtract the heat that's been generated above you match it to the thermal conductivity, check against the observations. Doesn't work particularly shallow. So what's our best guess for United Downs? Take 4,500, so you can see probably about 175, and you'll see that figure crop up uh, a bit later on. 
medium in here is a, around 190 and a bit. Could be as high as 200, but there is a 10% chance it will be colder. So really quite a big range, despite having taken great care to get some of these numbers right. So we don't know. So part of the reason for drilling our deep hole is just how hot is it. But we've done all the designs around 175. So we've taken the 90% the probability temperatures will be higher. So that's the first question. Is it going to be hot enough? We think so. Are there flow paths through the rock? Well, you saw a glimpse of some surface mapping of some fractures here. This is the Porth Town Fort Zone. It, we know it goes offshore to the south because it's been imaged in seismic data that was taken for Murphy Petroleum. We're pretty certain it goes off to the north because it's in the Burps data set. Um, but we've drawn them in dotted. Some of you know that there's a companion one of these over here between Campbell and Red Ruth which is ex almost exactly parallel to this. It forms the Tucking Mill Valley, for those who know that area. And there are Jurassic-sourced oil seeps on that fault at about 800 metres depth in the mine. Now, that has to be coming, doesn't it? Discussion point from somewhere off here. There's no Jurassic rocks anywhere near this particular, but it's got a definite Jurassic signature. Um, and this area is where all the hot springs are. BGS did a really detailed piece of work on the hot springs, and they're all along this structure. 60C at 300 metres and so on. And we think it's rising through this particular fault structure. So we're targeting it, and there's our site there, that little cross. Slightly blown up, and you can see it's quite a complex structure, and we're going for this more complex piece in here. There's the Wheel Jane Tailings Dam, if I give you uh, some presents there. We've been mapping. Yes, we have real geologists who go out and do real mapping, not just looking at the satellite pictures and so on. So John and Linda and Rosella, some of you know, marched up and down the valley mapping faults. And this is our best representation of the structure near the site. You can see we've put a hole down into that. You saw those three lines in there. Uh, this is a point where I would love to spin it around <laughs> and show it to you in 3D, but I can't. So that's, that's where we think we are. So we think the fracture surfaces are there. And here we are changing to some different software there's our exploration hole going down the centre. If it's as we think it is, we can put two of those production holes, like a module you've just seen, into that fault zone down below. Slightly different variant. And just to show you where that is, actually, Kaharak, Gwenup, St. Day, 12 heads. And interestingly enough, the local councillor lives in Kaharak, right over the zone. And he's a big supporter, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> so, we're going to inject water into that structure and recover water from the adjacent wells in the structure. What equipment do we need to get that for electricity? Now, I put this one in for engineers. This is actually an organic cycle. It's not a ranking cycle. It's a trilateral wet vapour system because what we do is we take R134, currently, although it's going to be replaced, but R134, let's look at this heat exchanger in here. So we've got R134 coming down. The water from the wells, 150 kilos at 175. Remember I said we were taking the low side comes through this heat exchanger. So it comes in at 175 and comes out at 63. So I've got 150 kilos at 63 on this, all of which is freely available to use if I can find something to do with the heat. 
So it comes in at 17 bar, 290 kilos, and I take out about 65 megawatts of heat out of that flow there. And coming out here in 134, I've got it up to 113 C. It's a liquid at this point. So those of you who know about thermodynamic cycles, see these are screw expanders, so I'm going to expand the liquid to a wet vapour in the screw. That's why it's called a trilateral wet vapour system. You get much more work out of it. And it goes through this screw, comes out at 44C, and I get five uh, megawatts out of either side of the expander. So I'm coming around here at 44C, 290 C, 290 kilos at 44C of now basically wet vapour into it. And I've got air, con air condensers here rather than the water one you saw earlier on comes down, take it back to a liquid. So I'm now at 24C, cooled down, 1.4 bar. So I need to use a feed pump to pressurise it back up and back round the system again. So I've got this big discharge of heat, 150 kilos at 63C, very close to a built up area. You could almost offer the community free district heating. Not that Cornwall is particularly suitable for district heating, but you could do that. But there's 59 megawatts of heat being rejected in the air from this cooling system. Again, so you can do some clever things with that and optimise that. It does say non-optimise. So you've got two heat sources in there. The net power out of this system would be about 8.2 megawatts out of a system that's there. This project has been put forward for funding. I was hoping to stand here today and say it got funding. I am told the funding's been approved. We were told we were going to have the document last Friday. We haven't got it, so I can't say it. But it's on the point of being approved. Is there someone to buy it? Yeah, we're going to sell electricity. We are next to a six megawatt connection, which is put in for a landfill gas project, which we will take over. So here's power. That's some more exotic. That's some more glamorous stuff. But actually, heat is probably where the most value is. Um, those, this is a Kokonda geothermal plant and they're doing desal with that waste heat from their production. Um, this is California swimming pools and plenty of people do tomatoes and bananas. Iceland is self-sufficient in bananas from geothermally heated greenhouses. More than 82 countries use geothermal heat. There are two deep systems in the UK. No geographic constraints, just the geology of aquifers and so on. 73 terawatt hours, 30 million tonnes of CO2 just on heat, this particular version. Lowest temperature of power production, Alaska. It's a bit of a cheat because you can use water at four centigrade for cooling. Uh, in general, commercially, Anything above 110 can be used technically. Whether it makes economic sense is another matter. But it's mostly direct use. The big five countries, China, USA, Turkey, Iceland and Japan, is where the bulk of this goes on. And you can see 75% is space heating and uh, swimming and spas and so on. Here's the two in the UK. This is the De Vere Hotel in Southampton. The pump is broken in Southampton at the minute, but it's being replaced. 73 centigrade from about 1,800 metres. Um, bath, 46C at the surface, thought to be coming from about four kilometres down in the Devonian. Activities going on people drilling deep, there's a plan to drill a 5k hole in Glasgow, there's a 2k hole being drilled in Newcastle, another one planned for Weirdale. Manchester's doing something to about 2.5k, um, Southampton's just about 2 kilometres and then you've got the two in Cornwall, both of which are around 4 to 5 kilometres. And then there's heat pump systems throughout the UK. So there's quite a lot of current activity in, in the geothermal space. Mixed uses, 
Anyone recognise where that is? It's the Blue Lagoon in Iceland, yes. Almost day rigueur, visitors have to go and swim in the Blue Lagoon. Um, and so, tourist attraction there. You could imagine the United Downs Spa, couldn't you? <laughs> it's Jubilee Pool. Jubilee Pool, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Desal, we've got several projects going on in the Middle East of putting desal in the desert. There's a really nice one in the southern part of Jordan, uh, taking brackish water and using, um, fun funded by the Saudis, They're using volcanic area there to produce uh, fresh water in the desert. Lots and lots of space heating and processes, but you can get a lot of heat out of a geothermal system. Now, one of the questions that always comes up is, aren't you cooling the earth down? Doesn't it do all sorts of horrid things to the earth when you cool it down and produce it? Well, actually, the oil and gas business produces three to ten times as much energy as uh, geothermal systems, and that's been going on a while. We use this heat occasionally, but the most important thing the oil and gas patch does for us is we get underground temperatures and get underground temperature maps. Just recently, there's been a, a temperature of over 180 C discovered in the North Sea, quite by accident. No one was expecting it. It's not in any way useful, but geologically it's interesting. So oil and gas results are, are really quite useful to us. And one of the biggest areas is lower temperatures, geothermal with heat pumps. I take it as a special case for direct use. This is actually Brisland Community Centre. Uh, that's an innovation centre, and this is National Forest Visitor Centre. Um, and all that's being done here is shallow holes drilled and then linked up with plastic pipe um, and connected up to heat pumps. I'll show you. Again, big change in power and energy. Huge growth rate, except in the UK. Um, and dominated by those five countries I, I've listed there. 70 million tonnes of carbon dioxide eliminated. You know, these are fairly big numbers. Typically, <coughs> holes drilled, loops in place, um, got to get the design right. The key issue is you've got to look at the whole system, the building, the heat pump and the ground. Unfortunately, in the UK, we tend to have people look at the building, people look at the ground, and then somebody comes along and thinks about the heat pump. Uh, actually, you can't do it that way. You've actually got to do it as an integrated design to get it to work properly. First one in the UK, ours are silly, was one of ours. Biggest one in the UK is Churchill Hospital, uh, 240 boreholes. Remember that number for a second. This is, a, this is the plant room for people who like plant. These are 500 kilowatt heat pumps at Churchill Hospital. Quite serious engineering. You want a bigger system? More pipe. It's very scalable. Just use more pipe. Lots of holes, lots more exploration of the geology in the area. They're used in different ways. America has predominantly cooling. Europe has predominantly heating. Europe non-domestic tends to be mixed use, and that's really good, as you'll see in a second. And high energy saving, 75 CO2. Oops, that one. Biggest one in the world, Ball State University in Indiana. A thousand miles of pipe. I said more pipe, but that's a bit excessive. Um, 3,600 boreholes says the largest in the US, it's actually the largest in the world by some way. Um, quite a clever system in Switzerland, which is a ETH, where in the summer they put the cooling heat underground and in the winter they pull it back and they use the ground as a buffer. Has reduced their energy bills enormously. Cornell is doing something similar. They're all over the UK, Port Cullis House, where they don't use the hot air, they use the hot water from the, uh, from the chalk. Old mine workings, this is where I did my PhD, this particular hole in the ground. 
and circulating water through mines. This is the Raleigh factory in Nottingham. So direct from the ground, old mine workings, closed loop systems um, that you saw in that drawing, flooded quarries. Huge number going on. We've put 2,000 systems in out of the 16,000, lots of them. There are some very poor ones, unfortunately. So where's it going? Future expansion linked to other renewable sources. Four times the renewable energy using a heat pump system. Decarbonising the grid. The Starkey Gardener dream, getting carbon out of heating. This is one of the holy grails of renewable energy and renewable, en and renewable heat. It's there, the technologies are all there, the geothermal is the linking buffer. It's being legislated for. February 2017, New York requires all new buildings have to consider geothermal heat pumps. They might reject them, but they have to consider it to be implemented if it's cost effective over 20 years. It always is cost effective over 20 years. So this has now become a state requirement in New York. What's the constraint? The constraint is that energy prices are still too cheap and there is no consequence on the environmental impact. We've got the social cost of carbon, of course, but there's no penalty for putting your carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Once we have carbon pricing and once we have energy prices which are uh, more realistic to the cost of their replacement value, um, you'll start to see these systems being considered more. At the moment they're generally considered too high risk and too capital intensive. Fundamental problem for power generation is we can't afford the expiration. It's taken since 1985 to get the money together to drill the five kilometre expiration hole at United Downs. The return on a geothermal system is like a utility, so there's no risk money in. People want absolute zero risk. So until you've got deep systems going, that bit doesn't happen unless you start to cost the externalities like the carbon dioxide. We've mentioned the questions, is it hot enough? Does it flow? Is there enough of it? Answer those and you've got a project. The other thing with electricity is not spot market. You've bought all your energy on day one. You actually need a guaranteed sales contract. That doesn't work so well when you're bidding into the grid at half hourly rates. There's no variable cost. Heat pumps, it's ignorance of the processes and how you link a building together and get the building design right. Final slide. You'll recognise that, Ian. Mm. <laughs> Slightly higher up the mountain. <laughs> It's expanding strongly. It is happening here slowly. It's expanding strongly elsewhere in terms of sustainable energy delivered. Two orders of magnitude is easily within grasp, but it needs geology and engineering, cross-disciplinary, to absolutely work hand in glove. Can't be in separate areas. You can't just go and get your geology report like you do on a mine and then do the engine. It's got to be together. We've got to optimise it to the to the uh, system. So it's a really cross-disciplinary area. The new technologies simply offer an overwhelming increase. Imagine if we can get this hot dry rock process working and we can get it working on the East Coast in America. The huge expansion we can have by coming up through that. And uh, there's areas there uh, Vicksburg and places like that, which look highly appropriate. But at the moment, gas is so cheap. But geothermal will be there, and I'm pretty certain within the lifetimes of you younger people, you're going to see it much more active, including here in the UK. Now, just to drive that point home, we don't need the sun and the wind. So, and... It's the cheapest form of power in California. Uh, 
This is a team effort. There's bits from all of my colleagues in there. Um, and as Ian said, we spun ourselves out of the Camborne School of Mines in 1985. Don't anyone who's got that thought, don't ever think that's a pleasant process. <laughs> Thank you.